Hello, I'm Jermaine and thank you for joining me on this video. I just wanted to quickly do an intro before we got into the actual video. I'm the host of Future Drive Podcast, which is a podcast that uh, goes into stories and has conversations with um, business people, optimistic go-getters, who we like to, how we like to sort of put it. Um, basically, we have conversations, get tips, tricks, um, and advice from people who are doing really cool things in their lives um, and, you know, making a real difference in the world. So recently, we just um, hit our 50th episode milestone. Uh, so the podcast producer, Hayden Fitzgerald, and I thought it'd be nice to sit down and have a conversation where instead of me being the host and interviewing others, Hayden would interview me and uh, go into things like the state of the industry at the moment. So uh, we work in marketing, um, business uh development, uh, that sort of adjacent fields. Um, so with coronavirus sort of happening around us, even currently, we're sort of coming out of it, but there's uh, there's indications that we're sort of going to face a second wave. So we wanted to talk about um, that, what, what's going to happen moving forward. Um, he wanted to sort of ask a few questions about my opinions as an employer, uh, as well as get into things like the top 12, which is a staple of the Future Tribe podcast. So without further ado, here's the intro and we'll get right into the video. Hello Future Tribe, welcome to another episode of the Future Tribe podcast. As you can probably tell from the video, if you're watching, I'm not Jermaine Muller, I'm Hayden Fitzgerald, the producer of the Future Tribe podcast. And um, this week, in commemoration of our 50th episode, uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. This week, I'm going to be interviewing the founder and CEO of Future Theory, Jermaine Muller. Hey, and the host of the Future Tribe And podcast. the host of the Future Tribe. How could I get that? How could I forget? <laughs> okay, how are you doing today, Jermaine? Good. I'm a bit anxious because I haven't really looked at the questions. Um, so I guess I'm just going to feel what every guest feels when I... I hop on a call with them. Yeah, and you're in the hot of, seat now. You, you <laughs> just don't get find it easy the Yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm excited though. I think All it right. should be good. All right. So to start off with, I think, you know, people have been listening to your voice for about 50 episodes now, but I don't feel like a lot of them really know you as a person yet. You know, mm -hmm. you're letting the other person do the talking. So tell me a bit about yourself outside of, you know, Future Theory and the podcast. What do you do in your spare time? What do you like to do outside of work? Yeah, so um, outside of work, I don't have a huge life, I guess you could say. <laughs> it, I just love uh, what we do at Future Theory, which yep. is you know, build websites, um, help small businesses, work on marketing, um, do branding, things like that. So my sort of out of work life tends to revolve around that a fair bit still. Um, you know, either it's playing around with concepts for uh, you know, not client projects or not, not sort of work projects, but personal projects. Um, I, I've got into mountain biking recently. I like to go for drives. Um, I hang out with my partner and my dog. Um, that's sort of, yeah, what takes up a lot of, a lot of my spare time. Nice, um, nice. Yeah. So let's get down to it. How long have you been working, working in the marketing field? Because I know the answer to this question. But when you told me, I was a bit shocked about how early you actually got into the marketing game. Yeah, so I really started exploring it back in 2008. Um, I was pretty young. Uh, I was still a teenager then. Um, but got into it uh, first, actually playing around with HTML and CSS. So nowadays, we build a lot of websites using WordPress. WordPress back then was still sort of um, quite young, you could say, or mm -hmm. quite new. Um, so yeah, just sort of started playing around back in 2008 and, um, I guess we're now 12 years down the, down the line and, um, I'm really, uh, I guess getting into the swing of things and, um, you know, I feel like I'm still learning almost every day. Yeah. Um, but now I feel like there's, there's a lot that I've also learned and a lot that I know versus, um, back, back then just, just everything was new and exciting and yeah. different. Awesome. Well, that sort of transitions well into when you started Future Theory proper, because mm -hmm. you are a very young person, um, a very young business owner, I would say. Um, everyone who I know who has met you has always commented on that. So when did you start 
future theory as we know it now? Um, it really, like, I look at, like, future theory proper, so to speak, starting, you know, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. But I registered the business in 2013. Okay. Um, sort of coming out of school, getting into uni, um, or looking at university as an option. Um, that's, that's when I really sort of registered the business. Um, and yeah, I think, um, like got a, got an ABN and, and all that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's in the last few years that we've really sort of hit our stride. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I liked, I got a lot of experience sort of working with, uh, working for other people, working with other people yeah. before I decided to take the lead full time into future theory. Yeah. Um, and I think that was important because it gave me an idea of what not just clients wanted, but how people, um, liked to be talked to and liked to handle, um, things like websites and branding and marketing, because it's actually, I find that those projects are quite unique. Like people don't, I mean, when was the last time you heard about someone going through the journey of building a website, like in your personal life? It's yeah. not, yeah. It's not something you hear, especially if they're working, like you hear about people building websites for school, for uni, for things like that, but they never or very rarely engage like a professional. Yeah, they're not a customer facing business. At the end of the day, that part of the company is usually handled by someone else. Yeah. And so you end up in your lifetime, maybe, maybe three to five years of your business owner, you get a website built and you engage with an external party, but, um, in the, in sort of the average person's life they just don't experience that so it was important to me to see almost the other side of it yeah um, and understand the other side of it and also get experience um just look at the different pain points and um the different facets because uh, especially in like design there's the there are the designers and the coders such developers yeah um and they they tend to be two different lots of people yeah um but um, I wanted to experience both sides so that I can understand both sides so that ultimately when I got into business for myself, it was a more rounded sort of solution that we could provide. Yeah, and that sort of transitions into what I want to talk about now. Now, if you don't know Jermaine or what he does here at Future Theory, he's a bit of a Swiss army knife when it comes to digital marketing. And I say that in the fact that he is a web designer, he is a photographer, he is a graphic designer by trade. Um, and he also does a whole other bunch of things. And what I've always respected about that is that you're not very specialized in one thing, but you do a lot of different things at a very high level. But I also want to ask you as someone who's gone out on themselves fairly young, do you feel pressure to keep honing these skills? Because, you know, many people, as you said, specialize in one aspect of marketing or design or, you know, creativity in general. How do you keep up with everything? And is there a pressure? To... Um, yeah, so that's why I said when you asked me, you know, what is my life like out of work? Yeah. I was like, it's not, there's not much, like, I don't think there's a whole lot to it. Like, you know, I'm not spending 20, 30 hours a week on a hobby, per yeah. se. Yeah. Um, but that is because I spend a lot of time, um, you know, to use your term, sort of honing those skills further. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's not, it's not necessarily a pressure, but I see a lot of people saying, you know, oh, I'm a web developer or I'm a graphic designer or I'm a photographer. And, um, those people might not necessarily be at that level where I think they should be charging for their services. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying always, what I try and do is ensure that I'm almost checking myself. Um, and making sure that, you know, when I say, okay, we can provide graphic design services, that either I can do it at, at a level where we can charge and, you know, be competitive in, a, in the market, mm. um, or we have someone um, working for us who can offer that service at a very fair, uh, very chargeable sort of, um, as a product, as a service, as yeah. a professional service. So, like, you mentioned photography. Um, that's something that I'm still trying to hone certain elements of photography. Um, you know, things like headshots we've provided for a long time and that's fairly simple, but I'm still trying to hone more the creative, the branding side of photography, yeah. you know, like the photos that you see when you visit a website, for example. Yeah. Um, and until I'm comfortable with that, I'm not going to offer it as a service um, or until we hire someone who has that expertise that I look at and go, yeah, you know, you've got what it takes to charge and to be charging fairly and to be doing it as a business and as a professional mm. versus um, just, you know, saying, oh, I know how to put together a website. 
I'm now a web designer. Yeah. I'm now going to go out there and offer the service. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, with any of these services, and I think with any business, their goal is to provide value. So as a business, um, you want to make sure that when you charge a dollar figure, on the back end, the client receives some sort of value. Like if it's marketing services, you know, they get more recognition. If it's photography services, you represent their brand really well um, in those photos. So it's important that on the back end, as much as I think people sometimes think that business is about making money and charging money mm. um, and end up with, you know, business models that are all about trying to, you know, I've seen people say, oh, I charge at this amount because I want to earn this amount. And, um, that that's all there is you know i worked out that i can do six hours of work a week uh sorry a day and i can work five days a week and i want to earn x amount so i'm going to charge this amount per hour mm. which to me is just the wrong approach to yeah um, it's the other side of the coin really yeah um you need to start at what what value can i provide and then how much can those values be priced at exactly um, yeah. as an exchange yeah. um and do you see a lot of that in the you know in the digital marketing space because from a person who's just getting into it now, um, I definitely see a lot of distrust in consumers, especially when it comes to you know um, taking on marketing services, because there are a lot of snake oil salesmen in the market. Uh, they are overcharging for their work, or you know their work is actually you know all sizzle no steak in the fact that it gets outsourced or it's done. You know they're not actually web designing; they're actually you know just using the simple framework that just allows them to click and drop stuff. Um, is that something that's hard to overcome? Because when you're trying to explain your value to consumers, you know, say like this, say, uh, you know, it costs X amount of dollars to develop a website mm. and someone goes, well, I can make a WordPress website for, you know, $10 a month or whatever. Yes. Or, you know, my son goes and, you know, has a DSLR camera. Why can't he take photos? Or, you know, I can get a, a logo made on a logo generator for ostensibly free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that sort of... Um... Yeah, well, it comes back to that sort of value and providing value. At the end of the day, um, it's... When you... when you And that's why I said, you know, it's not about money. Like, um, it, it's funny because those people who talk about, like, trying to build a system where, you know, they earn enough money that they're happy with it, they um, talk about it saying, you know, I deserve, I deserve to be paid this much mm. um, when I think you need to look at it on the other end and actually um, package your value that you provide. Yeah. Um, and you, when you package it correctly, there's just no competition, right? It's, it's sort of like when you look at, um, and then, you know, I use this example just because it's, it's an exaggerated example, um, in that, you know, you look at Ferrari, Bentley, um, and then there's, you know, the next level of Bentley Rolls Royce, mm -hmm. um, when you talk about cars. Now, these are very expensive cars. Now, on the, on the other end, you've got, um, Honda and all those sort of, um, staple brands sure. that are very affordable, economical vehicles. Um, and, there's a reason why Ferrari can charge so much more for a vehicle. Now, it's not just that they go fast, but there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more value that is provided. Yeah. Um, and they package it in such a way that the ideal clientele are looking at it going, yes, that provides... Because you talk to the average person who drives a $30,000, $40,000 car and you tell them that, you know, do you ever hope to own a Ferrari if you had the money? The general response I've heard is, it'll be cool, but I can it doesn't give me anything. I'd rather put that into a house. Yeah. And it's all about value. So that's how I see, um, well, that's how I've been able to overcome that. You know, there, and, and there have been meetings. Um, I mean, the last one, thankfully, was a few years ago now where I drove for about 40 minutes, which is a while when you live in Canberra. Yeah, um, of course. Because 40 minutes is You can get to one side of the city to the exactly. other. Yeah, yeah. Like you can cover the, cover the full sort of, um, uh, Canberra sort of boundary yep. um, in 40 minutes and um, I got there to have a conversation with a guy who um, basically wanted to uh, his budget was I think $120 for a, um, a full website marketing assistance social media the, the works yeah. um, and he'd he'd come to that sort of budget by looking online realizing that you know he can get that online um, but then I made it clear to him that the value that I provide and now we provide is on a, is just on a different level. You're mm. not just talking to some faceless, you know, 
person, um, which more often than not, it just is just one spokesperson, and behind them, they've got a bunch of um, people who just you know just just put out websites. Um, what what you get is a much more involved and much more value based. Service. Yeah, and it's a holistic approach. Again, you don't. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing marketing internally, but if all your marketing is not aimed at one, you know, strategic goal and, you know, it's taking away from the core business, like you working on the business itself, working on the actual product or service that you're providing the customer, it's ultimately going to, you know, hurt your business in the long run, not outsourcing it. And I think like that's, even as a person who doesn't own a business, I can obviously see that that's a problem where, you know, people, marketing is sort of a dirty word in the fact that people sort of see it as a way to spend money, but it's hard to quantify a return on investment. You know, mm. it's not like it's not like a typical investment where you can see, you know, cash flow coming in that was specifically generated by this function. Whereas it's hard not, to attribute yeah. like an activity to a dollar's sort of return. Yeah. yeah, and I think for that reason, people think that marketing is a money sink, which mm-hmm. is obviously not true. But I think that's unfortunately the opinion a lot of people have, and I know for a fact that you've dealt with that as well. Oh, yeah. Well, all, all the time, I think um, people don't necessarily see the value in it because, I mean, it goes back to this thing about there are a lot of people who are talking about Honda and Ferrari. There are a lot of people who look at cars as cars and they're just all cars, mm. you know. And when you look at it at that simplistic level, you're forgetting, you know, even simple things like one has leather seats and one has fabric fabric yeah. seats. And yeah. there's a different cost to each thing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do tend to sort of look at websites as a website's a website's a website. Yeah. Um, but Which you know, is crazy because like... Well, the, every I mean, day you, you experience di- different websites, but people don't think about it that way. But, because, that's like, but that's like the, you know, the front facing, you know, it's the modern day storefront of your business. I mean, like you would never walk into a business that has, you know, a rundown, you know, front entrance that has like a window broken that has like a door that's coming off the hinges so why would i stay at a website that's like obviously done in two seconds on uh, squarespace or wordpress or something or weeks and i'm like um, am i going to give you and your drop shipping company my money exactly exactly i mean it becomes even worse when you're talking about um professions like accountants and lawyers i've seen um smaller businesses when they're starting off um i've seen them build like Wix websites or a Squarespace website. Um, and um, the, the thing there to me is that you're asking them for a lot of trust and a lot of value mm-hmm. um, and a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and like you said, you know, drop shipping at least you get a product and it's very easy to say whether it was worth it oh, or not. With, yeah, with services, but it would be even harder. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it, you know, how much does an accountant cost or a lawyer cost? You know, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of, like over a lifetime. Oh, yeah. They'd be earning thousands of dollars per customer. Yeah. Yet, you know, in some instances, they have poorly constructed web presence. Yeah. Um, now, what I find is that a lot of them, um, when they're starting off or when when a business is starting off, it's just all word of mouth anyway. Yeah. So they use that as a way to generate that lead and then they really convince you that they know what they're talking about and what they're doing when you uh, reach out to them and have a meeting with them. Mm-hmm. And that's where you sort of get, not, not sold in a bad way, but... But that makes sense because, again, when you're spending thousands of dollars, like you need someone to sit down with you and explain, you know, you know, go through those cognitive steps of like, this is where your money is going. This is what we've done. And that sort of stuff that you can't really, um, you know, boil down in simple marketing material. And I get that, but it it totally just discounts the, the awareness part of, you know, the consumer journey where, yeah, it's fine. You know, like, oh, if I, if I needed a law firm, I'm sure that I would do my research and stuff like that. But you know where I'd start? I'd start at like Malagana's Edwards Johnson. And that's because, you know, they've spent so much money smartly on creating such a distinct, you know, marketing. Brand and brand awareness. Yeah. I mean, same with bloomers, I would say. It, exactly. Um, it's just, you know, bloomers, personal injury lawyers. Like it's just something that just comes to you. Yeah. Um, and again, I think, yeah, people, people sort of forget that side of things. Yeah. And I think that's where um, a more expensive website or a more expensive service generally tends to differentiate itself is that we can a well thought out website can do a lot of the convincing yeah um and therefore generate a generate a higher conversion rate or generate more people coming in 
turning into customers yeah. than a you know not as well thought out website. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that yeah. thinking takes time, and yeah. therefore there's a cost associated with it. Um, and you know you can build something more robust. You can build something less reliant on other services, like things like Wix and um, Squarespace. A big issue with those um, organizations or, or services, sorry, is that. If their service was to go down tomorrow, you don't really have any recourse. You can't just take that website and put it on a different server server and just go from there. Yeah. It's why we choose to use WordPress. Yeah. You know? It's something that I talk to clients about even when it comes to social media. Putting all your eggs in, in, in sort of one social media basket, mm. I personally think is getting increasingly dangerous because they are using artificial intelligence often with no people involved to shut down uh, pages yeah. based off sometimes arbitrary things. I just saw someone um, put up a put up a meme and got blocked from Facebook for 24 hours yeah. just because their content moderation AI decided you're not allowed to post on Facebook now for 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. And there's no recourse. Um, and if you're a business that you build, you know, you've built out your whole marketing channel on, say, Facebook, yeah. gets shut down tomorrow... That could put you in a really tight spot. Oh, absolutely, and and that's not an uncommon thing. Maybe it is in terms of um, typical businesses, but if you have you know a graphic design company that uses Instagram to you know generate clients, or even if you're a YouTube channel mm. that generates some revenue off that, and you you know you stream on other platforms, like if YouTube decides to demonetize your content or you know blacklists you, mm-hmm. like you have just lost all of your revenue, and you have no, as we said, no recourse because these big conglomerates don't have the resources to you know well and they don't they don't have they don't need to right yeah, like yeah. i mean they're just we're like you mentioned we're just small fish for yeah them. we're small fry they're sort of look at it going we can invest into getting you know a lot of staff in place to make sure that every small page you know gets their questions answered yeah or we can send that same staff member to work with a big organization say like a big media outlet to talk to that media outlet and make sure that they're happy because they're spending millions of dollars a year on advertising dollars and things like that Mm. um it just it just is almost this um i don't know there's this almost um counterintuitiveness to it yeah um and it's something that we need to be aware of as small businesses or even as a large business yeah of course i mean risk management is important no matter the size of the company um, I think this sort of leads into another good question because you've already sort of touched on it. When you meet with clients, what are typically the biggest mistakes that they are making in terms of their marketing strategy, their content strategy? And you've sort of mentioned that, you know, relying on one platform too much or, you know, not really investing enough into their online presence. Is there anything else that you would say is a... Well, funny enough, one is that um, they're t- focusing on one platform too much. Yeah. The other is that they're spread out too thin. Yeah. Um, that happens all the time. I mean, recently we had a client who, let's just say that their business deals with numbers and they wanted to start a um, an Instagram account. Mm. And my first response was, Instagram's a visual platform. How are you going to build? I mean, there are ways to do it through quotes and things like, you know, just putting up quotes around, I don't know, um, accounting and finance and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But you got to be careful not to spread it so thin that if someone comes onto your Instagram page, there's nothing on there and mm. people sort of just, um, well, it hurts you almost. Yeah, because it, it indicates to the consumer without you explicitly saying anything that, wow, mm. their social media pages aren't very well managed, they're not upkept, so is this a legit operation? Because that's like the first thing I would, you know, yeah. look at. Yeah, yeah. I saw, you know, an accountancy firm that, you know, that bothered to make a Facebook page or bothered to make an Instagram page and there's two posts from two years ago. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like... What's going on here? Like, did they stop... Did they cease to exist as a business for yeah. a little while? Did they go quiet? Um, and and especially when I've, I see clients continue to use, say, a Facebook page that they haven't posted on mm. in a long time to try and reach people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's even worse. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think to an extent, I mean, I'm a huge fan of creating like placeholder accounts. Yeah. Um, we've basically done that on most platforms and 
the reason for that is that we can sort of reserve that username for yeah. ourselves. Sure. Um, but then we don't, I wouldn't say, you know, suggest that you create, say, a placeholder account, put up two posts, and then start trying to get people and clients through that mm. because they're going to land on that page that you don't want them to see. Mm. Um, where if you narrow it down, one, you have more time to invest into a smaller sort of pool of uh, mediums, yeah. um, which means that you can just give it more attention. Um, and two, you can control the whole narrative a bit better. Yeah. And generally speaking as well, you really want your website to be the single source that people sort of funnel down to. And why is that? Because if you set it up correctly, you have the most control when it comes for, comes to a point of, you know, um, marketing and presence out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. If you build a website on an open source platform like WordPress.org and just host it with any company, you have much more control over that because WordPress.org, your website becomes just like an object that um, can be sort of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy. Uh, it's it's sort of like buying a baby seat um, for your baby um, or like a booster seat mm. um, that... You can move that from car to car yeah. versus buying a seat that is designed for a baby. Not a booster seat, but a whole seat that is designed for a baby that is customized for the car, car yeah. that you're in right now. Yeah. Um, and the risk there is that you end up with something that has a much more finite lifetime yeah. um, than that opportunity to then, you know, pick it up, move it on to something else or move it into a different car um, and so on and so forth and modify it. And, you know, you can pick it up and give it to someone to say, repair it. Mm. Um, and that's, that's what you want. Um, and you want the website, like at the end of the day, in terms of the internet out of, you know, out of everything that you can do on the internet as a, as a marketing or as, as a brand and as a company, um, the, the website just presents you with the most freedom, yeah. uh, presents you with the most opportunity to control all that. Um, and that's just what is important nowadays. Mm. Um, and, and tell me if I'm wrong in this, but I feel like the companies that have the most robust websites are also more flexible to deal with changes in the external environment. And with this coronavirus stuff that, you know, has happened and it's slowly getting better now, I found the companies that have a great digital content strategy and I want to shout out Akiba for this mm. were able to actually increase their profits when everyone else was struggling because as soon as it happened they built a pretty good online ordering system um, proprietary to you know oh not proprietary but it was specially made for their website and worked perfectly was able to cut out you know Uber Eats and stuff like that and end up making more money and it was all because you know they've made investments in and, and, and yeah exactly they've invested into uh, sources and channels yep. um, in in advance it, it, it's it, marketing is a similar thing like a lot of especially when I was starting off a lot of businesses came to us when they were about to go like bust next month yeah and the problem with that is that you need it's you need budget yeah. Right? yeah and and when you're not bringing in money how can you spend money mm. um, where like I mean this is an age age old thing. You spend money when when you can afford to. Yeah. That means when money's coming in. Yeah. And you save you you reap the benefits by saving money later on. Um, when you, you maybe not not can't afford to. Yeah. But you've put in the work before putting putting the legwork, build out the audience, and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, and then by controlling it, I mean you've talked about a key by building a, a custom solution for themselves. Yeah. They because they had. They had the lead generation down, down packed con in control, yeah. whether it's through Facebook or Instagram, social media, or, or just marketing. Because they had that controlled, they can then customize that end solution that they funnel people to. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I was sort of getting to. It's like, it's not the fact that they built an online ordering system because anyone can do that. Future mm -hmm. Theory did, yeah, that, we for did a, that for a few clients. For a bunch of our, um, our clients. But what I think those guys do so well is they understand that, you know, they need to, because you're exactly right, they have such a big social media following, like a lot of venues do, because they put so much effort into, hey, you know, you're in the venue, we'll take photos of you. Mm -hmm. We'll post it online. We'll tag we'll, you in it. We'll tag you. All yeah. of our menus and stuff are done expertly by graphic designers. Like, even the service scape, you know, it's done intentionally mm -hmm. to be so cool, to be so inviting, mm -hmm. that you buy into the Akiba and, by extension, the Kokomo's brand. 
Yeah. And I, I think that's a great idea because, you know, you could, a keeper would have done well, you know, no matter what. They do good food yeah. and stuff like that. And not to make this an a keeper podcast, <laughs> but I think you're exactly right where it's so funny that, because I think we're told the different when it comes to personal finance. When you're making money, it's good to save it. It's good yes. to, you know, put it in low, low risk investments and, you know, stockpile it. Whereas a business, you sort of find out it's almost flipped on its head where, well, funny enough, I mean, you use the word investments, right? So you talked about low risk investments. Yeah. Per- that, that's effectively what a business is doing. Yeah. Um, well, effectively in that they're, they're, businesses should be told to invest as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yet it's not something that people, that, that they do. Um, sorry to cut you off, but you know, you just, you, you, the terms you used exactly could be sort of, it's just almost the opposite, yeah. but it's the same. In yeah. That you're told to save. But a business is told to spend, but the outcome and the end goal is still the same thing. Yeah. And that is to multiply the value of whatever it is that you're yeah. investing, whether it is um, money, whether it is time, whether it is effort. Yeah. Um, but, there are pl- but, on the head. but there are plenty of people like that. I feel like scalability is almost, again, become a dirty word in terms of startups because when you say scalability, you instantly think of tech startups. You think of people like Uber who have you know, giant client base, but haven't really been able to monetize it to a level where they're actually profitable. So I'll, I'll change it to a bit more general questions about digital marketing. Um, with coronavirus in sort of mind and just the trajectory of the industry as itself, what do you think of the emerging lines of service, like the stuff that is going to become more important and the stuff that's going to become less important? Yeah, so I think... Um Given how easy it is to do things like build websites and things like that, I think better websites and more well thought out sort of avenues are going to become more important. Yeah. Um, not that they weren't before, but you know, a few years ago, um, it was very easy to just absolutely get a whole bunch of likes on Instagram, for example. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, um, reaching like the, I forget what they call the the feed where basically, you know, you get pushed to when you're like the most popular yep. within a certain time frame. Yeah. That was very easy to do a few years ago. Yeah. Um, but it's becoming harder now. And what's what's happening is that the, just the top of the top really just make it to make it to those um sort of feeds and pages and, and things like that. Yeah. Um and I think moving forward that's one thing that's gonna really be important. Mm. Um the whole whole customer experience as well. Yeah. Um, for a, I think for a long time you could you could afford to just sort of be lackluster in a few areas. Yeah. But nowadays social media makes it too easy to get punished for that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's only increasing as well. Um, personally, I think investing into um, a lot of one on one is is gonna again be very important. Um, I mean, drop shipping when it was starting off was really popular, and it had its time where everyone was saying just you know, drop shit, drop shit, drop shit. Yeah. Um, but I think, like, we even looking at our clients, there are a lot of clients who did really well through this, um, who focused on personalized service. And that can be online. That can yeah. be through Messenger or through a chat service. Absolutely, absolutely. But it needs to be personalized, yeah. right? And, yeah. it needs, and you need to be knowledgeable because people, again, there's so much knowledge at your fingertips nowadays that you really, again, need to rise above that. Yeah to be different yeah. otherwise you just get the same advice that they can just get for free from somewhere else yeah um and that just means that uh, you're competing with everyone which is scary and dangerous and you know all those not so good things mm. and with coronavirus not to you know harp on about it but have you what do you think that's going to change about the marketing industry because i feel like unfortunately it's going to you know cut marketing budgets um pretty drastically so how do you think that's going to affect not only you guys, but like bigger agencies and internal marketing teams? And Yeah, for a long time, I've felt like, um, so we really try and hit a nice balance of um, affordability and, um, you know, as, as good a service as, as sort of leading a service as we can provide. Um, and I've just seen that, Bigger companies just there's just naturally more fat, you yeah. Know, so yeah. so to speak, um, and there's more expenses, mm. um, and there's just more frivolous sort of spending. Mm. Um, there's this, 
I, I, sometimes I just look at companies' budgets and how much they spend on campaigns, yeah. and just set just it's unbelievable the the statistics. Um, in terms of, you know, how much it costs them to get a new client yep. and so on and so forth. Um, and it was fine when things were good mm. because there was no need to, you know, count your pennies. Yeah. Um, but coronavirus, I think it, it's been almost a bit of a resetter. Yeah. Um, and it's been, I think, this time where the, the real sort of business owners, you know, the entrepreneurial people who, um, who love looking for, um, ways to survive and ways to thrive and ways to innovate and differentiate, yeah. they'll come through and pull through this. Yes, they won't be as well off as they may have otherwise been, yeah. but they can just pull through. Yeah. Um, so it'll, it'll almost just like, I don't know. I think, I think almost the, the weak ones will be picked off. Yeah. Um, or at least people who are not saying not doing their job properly, but I find a lot of people, a common complaint online and when I talk to people like yourself, uh, they often will start campaigns or know people who start marketing campaigns or projects and when they're asked, how are you going to measure this? How are you going to measure the success of this? They sort of scratch their head and they go, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know how I would, you know, uh, assign a KPI to a, mm. a branding strategy, which I think is like now not something that can just be accepted. I feel like every dollar that is being spent it needs to be tracked and it's, um, you know, it needs to be stretched as far as it can, which means... And, it, and the return on investment sort of accounted for as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Definitely. Like, that's something that, again, I talk to clients because, um, funny enough, there's mechanisms in place in Facebook ads and Google ads and yeah. basically any ad platform where you can track your return on investment. Yeah. But... That's that. Uh, I think a lot of places just go. Okay, that's it. That's that's all we needed. Yeah. Um. But what we try and do is actually talk to the client as well and yeah. say, you know, these are the statistics. How was it on your end? Yeah, um, because I feel like a lot of those are misleading. And what you sort of forget is half of these channels that you use aren't digital uh, channels that link into your website or link into your, you know. Your Google Analytics and you know yeah things like word of mouth you yeah. can't track or even like you know if you're a restaurant you know you're going to use flyers as one of your mm-hmm. you know marketing strategies which is a great thing to do but if you have no way of counting for how many people were turned on to you because of this you you can print out a thousand flyers and never know how much good it's doing you exactly yeah or, or, or if it's doing you any good at all yeah. or you know what what can you attribute you know do you attribute um a uh, uptake in, um, say, deliveries to Facebook ads yeah, yeah. or to flyers. Um, so, I mean, I don't think there's an excuse nowadays for for companies and individuals to not track this stuff. Yeah. Um, I think um, it's very easy to track it nowadays, and and you, you should be tracking it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think it'll it like you said it'll just sort of um, I guess make it more obvious. Um, the people who are phoning it in or just not doing as much as they should be or could be doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to shift now to sort of you as a business owner mm-hmm. and an entrepreneur. Um, so you, <laughs> entrepreneur. I don't know how much I like that term. Nah, but a, bit, uh, <laughs> I get what a, a self-starter, I should <laughs> say. Um, so one of the things that astonishes me about you and about starting a business in general is that there's so much stuff behind the scenes that you wouldn't even think would be a problem that is, you know, like, paying people, creating invoices, um, you know, creating, obviously the branding would be a bit easier considering, yeah. you know, you're a marketer that's and stuff like that. Yeah, but, but that's a problem for someone who doesn't yeah. as a service. So yeah. what are some of like the hardest parts of being a business owner that you'd never saw coming that, you know, when you started Future Theory in 2013, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed that you were like, you didn't even know this was going to be a problem. Funny enough, I think marketing was the big one. Yeah. Um, and understanding, you need to really understand um, where your next clients are going to come from. Yeah. Um, that's one element of it that, that was really challenging. Um, the other element is keep making sure that your clients are in the loop and in the know. Of, yeah. It's something that I hear about even now, a lot of saying, 
we talked to any web developer in the past and we start a website and, you know, we don't hear from them for three weeks and then they come back saying, oh, here it is. Here's your first concept. What's your feedback? And then, you know, we get, we converse for another week or two and then they vanish again and there's no sort of touching base and yeah, yeah. talking about it. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of it that we're, we're still trying to become better at in yeah. terms of, um, it was it was easy when it was just a matter of emailing client checking in. Yeah. But when we have multiple now multiple multiple projects on the go, yeah. We need a way where they can just check in at their leisure. Mm. So you know, integrating that sort of um, project management system, um, and the big one I think, and again, we're still trying to get it right, is just getting the systems and procedures right. Yeah. yeah. Um, just. The, the way I like to think about it is I, I love people and I think the people pro- within a business um, are really important. That they're, they're just like, they're everything, right? Like you as a staff member is, if you didn't exist, you bring a unique value to, to the business that sure. if we took you out of it, we need to find someone with at least the same energy, yeah. let alone the same expertise and yeah. so on and so forth. Um, but when you come up with this, the operating procedures... I think it's important to remove that person and come up with steps so that you can at the very least make sure that a task is done. Yeah. Now, whether that task is done to the same level of expertise is different. Is, is hard to control, but sort of op- just operationalizing those because yeah. as we scale up, that's only going to become more of a problem. Well, that seems like that's sort of like the glass ceiling that exists for a lot of businesses and why I think so many of them stay at a position where they either... Uh, you know, have two or three people full time and then a couple of contractors and then, you know, have like a spouse or something running admin mm-hmm. stuff. Because really, when you extend it beyond that, it becomes a logistical nightmare. Like it, it doubling our stuff now would, I think, increase your workload five times. Yeah, I was going to say by like three to five hundred percent. Yeah. Which which isn't, it's like almost like an exponential scaling up. Yeah. Um, and... You know, there is like a, a soft sort of number that they say that one person can manage, say, eight people. Yeah. Um, now, whether that one person then gets to do the work that they need to do in their day. Yeah. Because I can imagine if I had to manage eight people, I'd want to, you know, I wouldn't want to check in with them at least for an hour a day. Yeah. But I'd, there'd have to be some level of, you know, being open for them coming and saying, Jermaine, I have this question or that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we have more s- sort of steps in place and we we refine that as well, that's the other thing. Like, um, you know, get a bunch of steps, say, Hayden, here, follow these. Mm. And then we'll touch base in a week and talk about what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. Refine that and then get that. The idea would be to get that to such a good place that if another Hayden was needed, yeah. they'd be able to come on board and follow uh, and get on board and get up to speed much more seamlessly. So, so how are you figuring this stuff out? Because I know a lot of it is trial and error, obviously, like any business. But when you were first starting out and you were first trying to figure out these systems and all the logistical stuff that you need behind the scenes, were you getting sources online? Were you going to business coaches? Were you, did you have a mentor or yeah, someone so, like that? Um, I've been fortunate to have um, at least two people who I, can, uh, who I would call sort of a mentor. Yeah. Um, you know, never in like an official capacity. Uh, ne- yeah. Been fortunate not to have to sort of pay for that. I know people try and pay, try and look for someone to help them and, and pay for that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes up to, you know, $10,000 a month sort of thing, which is, yeah. which is crazy. Um, but what I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, I, I love just experimenting, trying, working it out, failing, mm. um, trying to fix that issue that, that then appears yeah. and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a certain level of like resiliency that you need when you're starting a business. Yeah, and it, well, it's, it's, it's resilience as much as just uh, um, getting rid of any ego. Sort yeah. of going, yeah, that, that, was, that was a bad move, you know. Yeah. I, I priced that project way off. Like that was, it was wrong to price that project at X amount. Or I mean, that's a mistake that um, I think a lot of businesses and a lot of, people getting into it learn is that you know you think okay like let's let's price it on 10 hours and it turns out be to be 15 yeah example. yeah um, and that matters so much not to cut you off but it reminds me of a funny story because my friend obviously runs a gardening business and he mm-hmm. helped out another friend of mine who wanted to do something similar and he goes to his and he quotes you know the friend who's starting out quotes you know uh, a job of doing a yard and stuff like that and he gets my other mate to come over 
And he's like, oh, yeah, I said this was that would be done in four hours. And he said, you're going to need the Avengers, mate. Because it's going to take 20 <laughs> hours, gonna... mate. Like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just something that you learn. And I think, I think in those sorts of scenarios and situations, you need to just not have any of the ego. Yeah. Just go... I stuffed up. Yeah. And, and if that means that you only pay yourself two bucks an hour, yeah. um, because, you know, depending on the situation and the project, they might not be capacity to turn around and say, hey, um, I'm sorry, I really quoted that really wrong. Well, it's your mistake at the end of the day. I mean, like, you can't ask the If you went and said, here are what my service is going to cost to the consumer, and then you backtrack and be like, uh, I made a mistake and you need to pay me more. It's a bit of a hard pill to swallow. Especially four times as much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it is. And it's just a learning learning sort of experience of sort of going um, just trial and error. Yeah. And, and then learn, like making sure that you learn learn the true, um, true, I guess, points from that mistake. Yeah. I think sometimes you, it's easy to think you're learning from the mistake, but you sort of miss the whole point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or you just look at the ease, the stuff that's e- more palatable. And yeah. You forget the stuff that, you know, um, you, you've got, almost got to be just a bit harder on yourself. Yeah. And, and that's, I, I think that's okay because um, at the end of the day, you've got to be the hardest on yourself. If you're providing a, a service um, mm. to someone else, mm. you need to make sure that, that service is worth it. Yeah. Um, it's it's still one of my biggest fears is that we provide a service and the client wouldn't feel it's worth it. Um, but do you feel like that sort of creates like a, a bit of like a disconnect? Because obviously you want to do stuff to the best of your ability because, of, you know, it's your name on the business. Like mm, you are the... It's in, in my interest. Yeah, yeah. But you've always also said to me that being done is being better than perfect you know what i mean like yeah yeah i mean the way we handled that is that um we are around once once a website launches yeah we're still around yeah yeah. um and we we touch base you know um and 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 i talk to the client and say you know i'd like to check in with you you know every two weeks is okay or if there's any issues come back to me um because i agree done is better than perfect yeah um and it's something that I again still struggle with sort of just recognizing that okay this is done mm. and to be honest this is 99% there there might be 1% that needs to be sort of tweaked but that would that will get tweaked that yeah. will be fixed yeah um, and you know the catch when it comes to things like websites is that they're always evolving you know there's yeah. new trends coming up yeah. there's like a website that you built five years ago is a completely has to be a completely different website nowadays yeah like TikTok didn't exist five years ago. Yeah, and you know if you're if you're listening to this sort of laughing, TikTok's not a legitimate sort of business source or a lead generator. There are heaps of businesses who thrive on TikTok because of because of the nature of what they do. And it's more important to like you know take TikTok out of the equation, just like any you know online X, Y, and Z. Exactly. Well, any 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 um, source, that, yeah. any lead source yeah. um, out there, you just need to be able to adjust to that. Yeah. Um, and that just means that, you know, done is better than perfect and perfect is never achieved or attained because, you know, just as you get, just as you think to yourself, okay, the Instagram integration is working perfectly and so is the Facebook integration, a new social media platform comes along yeah. or a new web standard comes along yeah. or a new medium that people are listening to comes along. Yeah. You know, people might podcasts sort of came out of nowhere they still haven't hit mainstream but yeah. you know that will happen yeah video is still big yeah um but you need to you need to be able to almost be agile enough to take those things do them and recognize that it's they almost have a lifetime yeah what well, a lifetime of optimal sort of uh return on investment mm. but then because you launch a, web, a, a new video today and if you really push it it'll be really useful for three to six months yeah after that, once once your target market sees it enough times, it's much less use, but it still provides value if you sit it in a good location on your website. Yeah. So it's sort of balancing all, all that out there, I think. Yeah. Um, what are some of the biggest achievements you've had at Future Theory that you're personally the most proud of? And what are like some of the biggest mistakes that you like, you know, constantly think back to? Yeah, so um, I mean, the biggest biggest thing in my opinion is just... Is just I don't want to name clients, but just working with uh, especially clients who really took what we worked, what we did for them, and then just added their flavor on top, and then just touch base regularly, and um, just you know. 
becomes a real team effort. Yeah. Um, to me, those are the biggest wins. Yeah. Um, because that's how I see um, myself and yeah. us sort of, I mean, some of my, like my first clients back in 2008 are still working with us today. Yeah. Um, to, to some degree at yeah. the very least. And, you know, I've grown a lot. Back in the day, I used to charge $10, $15 an hour. Um, it's a different time now, yeah. and, but, but, but we're a different business. So it's interesting that they still sort of came along for that journey. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that sort of, like, to me, that's the biggest win is just hitting, like, getting some, like, I mean, more than a handful of clients who just go with it and some of them are just, like, one, two, three-person teams who just know to innovate and sort of take the advice, put their own spin on it, spit it out there. Just just fantastic. Yeah. In terms of mistakes, um, it's, it's a... I think trusting people to an extent. Yeah. Um, I haven't lost a lot of money to trust, like, because I've trusted people. But you know, over the years, like a few thousand dollars um, has been lost by people oh, wow. who like stealing things. And it's not at the end of the day, given the scale of projects that we do, it's not the end of the world. But mm. it, it is still felt. Yeah. It's still something I listen back to. Um, and you know, <sighs> was this in terms of people you? commissioned for work and they didn't do the work or is this something uh people who yeah well people who we did work for who just didn't end up paying oh, or wow. did end up you know trying to essentially steal our service yeah and then yeah. just run away and not pay yeah um and you know at the end of the day i think i think back to those things every once in a while and it's sort of it's just one of those things where i wish it didn't sort of turn out that way mm. i mean i'm talking like it's less than one percent of yeah, like, yeah. It's not even like it's it doesn't really register, but um and, and uh, genuinely in those instances, I don't think having a contract would have helped. I don't think any any of that would have helped. I mean, it's too hard. I mean, every small business owner I know has the same story where someone owes you three hundred dollars, and it's in that period where it's like, what am I going to do? Take them to small claims court and spend heaps of money to get this back, or am I just gonna like I just have to eat it? Exactly. You just have to sort of suck it up. Yeah. Um, that's that's a mistake, I think. Um, and not, uh, I mean, you know, going back to the advice that I gave around um, understanding your lead sources and lead generation and mm. systemizing things, mm. I wish I did that earlier. Yeah. Um, because then it, once you have it refined well enough, it just becomes this, um, you know, rinse and repeat sort of thing in a, in a very good way, in a very yeah, nice yeah. way in that you can just, you just know that, you know, these, these sources are really great or these channels are really get, great to get leads. Yeah. You know what you have to post, you know how you have to post it, you know you have to, who you have to talk to. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes in to get work done, you have it all systemized so that not, not so that you give everyone the same service because that's another thing that we really try and do is not, is, is to provide a cust- very custom service. So yeah. that, you know, it's like a fitted suit versus a suit, right? Mm. Um, there's, there's a huge price gap between the two. Yeah. Um, because there's a different level of refinement. Yeah. Um, and it's just, for us, it's about making sure that we can provide a customized service, but you can, you can, you can systemize how you customize. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. Of course. Um, and it's about doing that. And, you know, um, I think if if we did that earlier, we could have scaled more. And you know, it, it all comes back to. I know you're a bit of a maths guy, like you know, like you like mm. numbers. Yeah. Um, and numbers are very. You you can almost put numbers around everything, right? Yeah. Um, and business is is definitely an area where you can do that. So I wish I did a lot more of that. Yeah. Um, putting numbers and understanding things things better. Yeah. Um, and oh, a big thing as well is um, just using some sort of invoicing system as soon as possible. Um, that's a big thing that I just, just sort of remembered is um, people don't realize like there are, there are just free services like Wave Apps out there. I, yeah. used, I used them for a long, long time before sort of moving to a paid version. Yeah. But even the paid services like QuickBooks cost, I think, $16, $20 a month. Yeah. Which if you have a business... Um, you can, you know, you can just break break that down and get each client to pay per hour, and that'll end up being like ten cents an hour or something. Yeah, which is it just, it's just something that you have to do because then you can track. You can first of all provide a professional 
sort of invoice mm. and then track how long that takes and then use again coming back to those numbers use those numbers to understand the business yeah um understand and, and better communicate to them probably like where their money is going because i feel you know if if you're you know giving a marketing agency four thousand dollars i'm not happy if they're just coming back you know having spent it and be like here's the stuff we created see you later yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly and you need you provide more levels of like um there was a time when we'd the invoice would say you know uh, for website services for uh, hayden.com.au yeah nowadays it's you know website development uh website framework setup website yeah. foundational setup security testing yeah like we really break it down because like you said it communicates this is what this is all the things that you've added for yeah um versus you know Here's here's a solution, which is important when there's you know informational asymmetry. I, I sort of equate it to you know when you go to a mechanic or a panel beater and stuff like that, why they give you a quote that says um, removing this panel will take fifteen minutes at my hourly rate. Here's yes. what it gets because you don't know what it takes to get out of debt. You don't know what it takes to fix the headlight. You don't yeah. know. You don't know what it's in, what is involved, let alone. Um, the cost of what is involved, yep. the time. So you're going to be, yeah. So you're going to be skeptical about how much my like, you know, four thousand dollars to fix, you know, the front panel of my car. Like, are you, are you joking? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, surely it's just a matter of you know hitting the dent back the other way. Yeah, but it's like, no, no, no. I have to take out like all these you know things in the car, and I have to go get, a, panel, get a spare part. And all yes. That. So yeah, I totally get that. Um, are there any other general tips before we sort of move on to a different topic um, for business owners? You know, if I'm a person who's worked in the industry for a little bit, I'm honing my skills and I'm sort of thinking about going out on my own. Are there any other tips like specifically regarding like the financial aspect of it? Because I'm assuming that would be very scary. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, and this might, people might cringe, yeah. but I almost say don't look at the number, don't look at the like dollar number. Mm. Um, look at just generating cash flow and yeah. putting out work. Yeah. Um, because... When you just focus on the number, it just ends up being about the dollar fees. Like, yeah. And, and, and you, you know, when I say number here, I mean I mean how much income mm. um, because that's just missing the point. That's not what, what it should be about. It should be about providing value. It should be about, um, at the end of the day, if you provide good work at a reasonable price and you keep people happy, yeah. then um, they're going to come back. They're going to tell their friends about it. Yeah. So on and so forth. Yeah. So... Um, I think that's that's like my big thing. Even mm-hmm. now, it's it's I take a minimum wage out of the business. Mm-hmm. It's about investing it all, and it's about having money there for the business to do more, to innovate more, to yeah. provide more value. Um, because it doesn't have to, you know. I'm not trying to sell out or sell the business in twelve months. Yeah, it's about sort of creating something bigger, and that growth takes reinvestment. Yeah, and that freedom to an extent of having um knowing that you have to put out you know 50 hours of work per person per week and how much income is coming in it doesn't have to necessarily you know okay it doesn't have to say 100 bucks an hour uh, 50 50 hours of work a week mm. that doesn't have to match up like mm. you might end up earning only 20 dollars an hour yeah but it's important that you provide that value and make sure that when you provide that value it is as well-rounded mm. and as holistic as possible. Yeah. So basically saying that you shouldn't expect from the door to be making exactly what you made in your previous role and and expect that generating cash flow and generating a client base is going to be pretty It's hard. going to take time. Yeah. And, and, and just forget that. Like, at the end of the day, you're comparing numbers that don't even, like, have no right being compared, yeah. right? It's sort of like comparing... Um, I mean, you know, going back to the analogy of cars, um, it's like comparing, um, or, or travel, sorry, like getting from point A to point B. It's like comparing the price of a car and the cost of a car and the cost of a mountain bike. Mm-hmm. They're, they're on two different scales. You're not, you, yes, you can use, you know, the same dollar figures to work out, oh, this is how much it'll cost me per kilometer, so on and so forth. Yeah. But they're completely different things. Yeah. Um, even though they get you from point A to point B. Sure. Um, and you need to treat it like that. Yeah. Because um, if it's just about the money, just just go work for someone else. Yeah. Yeah, way less to worry about. Yeah. You, you get super paid. You get uh, a regular um, regular wage. Yeah. Um, you can get 
your holidays are sort of booked off yeah. and booked away. That's beautiful. If that's what you want, keep, yeah. keep doing that. Yeah. But don't don't get into business for the money. I, I know I know you hear it a lot, but like get into it because you want to do something bigger yeah. um, and you know that you can provide value or you know that you'll get to a point where you can provide value yeah. um, and, you know, not because of how much more money you can make. Yeah, I, I think that's a great thing to say because, I mean, everyone says it about everything. I mean, actors will say it about acting. Um, people who have online presences will say it about, you know, doing that. It's like if you start making YouTube videos for the sole purpose of being a millionaire and being rich... You're never going to last because if you don't have a passion for what you're doing, it's going to get very old. Very it'll, quick. it'll show in your work, and you'll become burnt out. And I, th- I think that goes for everything. I think like you know, if you're becoming a doctor for the sake of being a doctor because your parents like wanted you to become a doctor, <laughs> you're going to hate it. Like, yeah, it's it's not fun, right? You've and got same to put with being a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. All right. So now I think I'm going to transition into a couple of questions that will sort of interest I think younger people who want to get into marketing or the marketing industry because you actually have a very unique uh, perspective because you hire people Mm -hmm. in this space now you're a business owner you know you've done interviews with people you know what to look for you know I work for you uh, obviously (laughs) so I think I want to ask you some questions about that because I feel like you know there's sort of a lot of different avenues to get into the marketing industry and a lot of different information that people will tell you about you know whether you should go to university whether you should just upskill yourself whether so is studying marketing at university mandatory for you know basically the work that you do and like that's that's a contentious question because i'm sure you know that there's almost two different schools of thought around it Mm. My personal belief is that what matters more when it comes to any anything that you do, obviously there's like industries like medical industry where you have to get certain qualifications because there's there's sort of legal um, parameters and governmental sort of oversight. Yeah. Um, but in any other area, to me, what matters more is your attitude towards it um, versus how much you learn from a organization and an educational institution so um as an extension of that and i'm not sure if this is one of your questions later on but like when i'm looking to hire someone Mm. or work with someone one big thing i look for is attitude yeah um, and and sort of um passion for what we may or may not be doing yeah um because at the end of the day i think skills can be taught yeah Um, yes creativity can't necessarily be taught to someone Mm. But if you have the right attitude, you'll get there anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just that attitude that matters more versus like um, official like you know credentials and education. And, yeah. and all that. It, those things make it easy to gauge if someone has at least the like the core competencies around something. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't like I've never seen you know that translate one to one in terms of you know let's say you went to uni and did a- academically really well in marketing. Yeah, that doesn't make you good marketer because there's heaps of people every year from every single uni who graduate with like really high GPAs. Yeah. But you don't see them all going around, you know, being the top marketer in their field. Yeah. There just isn't that happening. Yeah. So. And, I, and I think, you know, putting in my two cents as a person who is, you know, about to graduate and it's sort of what you describe. Like I do pretty well on all the marketing subjects. Uh, the problem with them and I think with the university in general And not to harp on university being bad, because I totally don't think that's the case, but I think they get stuck in the theory a lot, which is important in aspects of marketing, such as consumer behavior, which are very psychology-based. Yes. Yeah, which there's a science, more of a science behind. But the problem is, is that I never got taught to use any of the tools that I currently use now working for Jermaine, you know? I never got taught the importance of, you know, using basic graphic design tools. I never got... I've never ever learned how to use Google Analytics in university. I've never learned how to edit a WordPress blog um, in university. And of course, these are things that can be taught. But I think what's interesting is that if you do an accounting course, you have to use MYOB. You have to use zero. This is not like there's no other two ways about it. You have to use these things. But in marketing, you sort of don't have to. Mm, mm. So because, like, and I guess it's partly of partly the thing around it as well is that marketing is so big and there's so many options and there's so many platforms out there and it's dynamic it's changing i feel like i was talking to a bloke who 
currently is the general manager of the Braves and the, the Canberra Braves and um the Cavalry and he did marketing and stuff like that and he sort of goes on to say that I learned so much in school that I don't apply now because I sort of came in before the digital um you know advent in marketing so a lot of the stuff I learned is cool and you know it's interesting and it, it helped me in certain respects but it didn't make any of the marketing jobs that I had leading to now any easier. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or in some cases, making any better. At. So with that being said, what are some like desirable skills that you look for in potential employees? Like, And and what are ones that aren't so important? And I'll, I'll sort of give you my point of view on this before I let you get into it. Um, a lot of people will say learning graphic design is a good skill to have, but if you want to do marketing proper at a you know a big agency or internally at a place that they will have people who can usually do that sort of stuff and you will be focused more on the actual like strategic elements of it like, what is your thoughts on that and what skills are less desirable and what skills do you think are super desirable yeah it, it, in my opinion having a good grasp of it all yes yeah. is really important yeah um and it's not like it's hard to do like um there's nothing stopping you from downloading Adobe Creative Cloud. Yeah. Like, there's nothing stopping you from learning Photoshop. Um, there's there's no skill level required. Like, there's nothing stopping you from looking up videos on YouTube on how to how to use these um, packages and services. Mm. Um, I think you know you touched on sort of graphic design not say being as important, but the thing there is that 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 only happens when you work for such a big organization that they get enough throughput to justify one person or multiple people just focusing on one um one sort of creative service yeah one strategic service yeah um in my opinion smaller businesses should be looking for part-time sort of marketing managers almost yeah. like even if it's two days a week that's how i, I spent a lot of my sort of initial days um mm. And what helped there was just knowing, maybe not necessarily being an expert in all the fields, mm. but just knowing enough. Yeah. Sort of knowing, you know, the theory around how how something should be done so that even if you were to outsource it or send it to another person, yeah. you have some knowledge of that process. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to me, if you're looking at going into marketing, just having a knowledge of all those areas. And this is the thing, like, like, I've, like I mentioned before, or just, just then... There's nothing stopping you from, you know, Googling it and YouTubing it and understanding it and learning those things. Yeah. Um, because even if you work on the strategic side of, say, a big marketing agency, yeah. it's handy to know what is possible from, a, say, if if all they use is Photoshop or all they use is Illustrator, yeah. it's good to know what is possible from a creative output mm. so that when you're thinking about the strategic side, you're not doing, let's say you have someone who's an expert um, motion graphics like designer and animator yeah and you're not ask, you can then make sure that you're not asking them to do something that's out of scope for them yeah um, but if you didn't have that knowledge you would just come to the come you would to the assume that it's all the same thing and they can do it yeah or, or, or that you know they can just do it like yeah. that that as far as you're concerned that should be something that they can put out and do mm-hmm. um, but it helps to have that knowledge um, going into that mm-hmm. to know that okay this is the limits of what someone who knows how to use illustrator yeah. can do yeah. or someone who knows how to use after effects can do yeah and i mean that ex- that just you know goes on and on and on um where that's applicable to any sort of package or service yeah um cool do you have any specific um recommendations for like software packages that you would yeah creative so adobe creative cloud yeah like creative suite um understand you know i think with websites being so important, understanding how domain names work, yeah. how website hosting works, yeah. what WordPress is. Again, all these things cost very little to, like, a domain name's like $10 a year. Yeah. Hosting is, again, you can get very cheap services for hosting that let you set up a WordPress environment, play around with it. Mm. Um, you can even download uh, services like Flywheel that let you install a local instance of WordPress. Um, so you un- understand how all that works and how all that looks and yeah. and what it means. Yeah. Um, so at the very least, I mean, when you go to a mechanic, let's say, to fix um, something that's wrong with your engine, mm. it's much more helpful if you know the general... Like, you don't have to know specifics of how an engine works, but understanding, you know, why um, the, the engine makes a funny sound when you accelerate mm. um, is much easier to sort of get your head around. Yeah. 
if you know what happens when you put press down on the accelerator yep. versus having no idea how an engine works. And it's sort of yeah. Bad. So like I think the general advice that Jermaine is trying to say here is that if you want to learn how to do um, a lot of different stuff, you should try to do it yourself. I mean, the advice that I've been given, I think it's good, is that if you want to learn how to use like stuff like Google Analytics, start a blog. Start about writing about stuff. It doesn't have to be like great writing or interesting stuff, yeah. but just like, you know, create something that links to it, figure out it, because learning by doing is going to be better than watching a YouTube video and trying to remember it. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, and it's important then not to not to then market that that knowledge incorrectly, of, yeah. of course. I've, I've had instances where people say, oh, yeah, no, I know how to use Google Analytics. And it turns out that they know how to link it to a website and look at, you know, one one tenth, one twentieth of the information coming in. Yeah. So you know, never oversell that. But mm. but at the very least, you know, like if someone was to say, okay, can you log into Google Analytics? At least you know how that works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How how it works to find your uh, property and and sort of find the specific website. Um, because past that, there's a lot of documentation out there for a lot of services. It's all well documented that it that's not stopping you from sort of you know, making progress in that area. Yep. Uh, I think the last question I'm going to ask you is for even people who, you know, maybe they're coming out of high school and maybe they're interested in marketing or graphic design or, you know, um, web development. How do you know whether this stuff is for you? And like what? It's it's a broad question, but I think, you know, as someone who's worked in it in mm. both, for both a, a company, you know, working for someone and, who started a business in the industry like what do you need to ask yourself and what type of work are you doing you know day to day yeah good question i think i think it's just about looking at what you what what makes you genuinely happy and what makes you excited mm -hmm. um because the beauty with marketing is if you wanted to chase after just one specific niche like if you only wanted to develop websites mm -hmm. there is something out that there, there are jobs out there for that specific niche. Mm -hmm. If you only wanted to design the front end of a website, there's something out there for you, so on and so forth, which is really nice, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, for some people that, like, developing websites and coding is just all they want to do and can think of doing. Yeah. And then that's fantastic. Uh, for some people, they couldn't think of anything worse. Mm. Um, it, it's it's sort of thinking about it and then actually doing it. And uh, again, like, like we've, just touched on it's very easy to experiment and see if this is for you yeah you know if it, if it excites you to try and work out um why you know cross browser compatibility of of a certain aspect of say html or css mm. um then you know that solving problems in that sort of nature mm. is something that you look forward to yeah versus if again you can't think of anything worse mm. you know that okay that's not for you or that's not for me. Yeah. Um, so that would be my big tip. Cool. Well, I think that sort of wraps up the questions that I have. But, you know, if you listen to this podcast, you know how this episode is going to end. It's going to end with the top 12. Ooh. Ooh. I forgot about the top 12. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, right. Um, so to people who don't know, if you're a first-time listener, basically, Jermaine's going to give us 12 recommendations. Um, three are going to be books or podcasts he likes, three software he can't live without, three mantras he lives by, and then three people he admires. So let's start with the books or podcasts. You're a big podcast listener, so mm -hmm. let's start there. This what was pretty easy. Um, so I love Wandry, who's a, a podcast um, publisher. Mm. Um, I listen to Business Wars. Mm. Um, Business Wars is really interesting because they go through just epic sort of business battles. Mm. Um, the recent... Recently, they released Uber versus Lyft. So there's, I listened to uh, episode one of You Should Some Multi-Part Series. Yeah. You know, things like Ferrari versus Lamborghini, um, uh, Patagonia versus, oh, who is their competitor? Allface? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, there's just amazing sort of stories there. And I yeah. think there's a lot that you can learn out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. Um, get, I'm getting back into Nathan Latka's... Um, podcast i think he calls it oh forget what he calls it but we can link it um, yeah yeah forget the name of the podcast but um like again today's episode was um from the founder of design pickle which oh, is yeah. this um software as a service almost like um productized uh, service platform it's they're the biggest um 
unlimited like flat price design service in the world mm. that that they get he gets he asked really tough questions it's usually about a 20 30 minute episode and you know interviewed everyone from the founder of zoom um to you know i think the guys behind mailchimp as well yeah so, um pretty pretty awesome podcast yeah there. um and the other one um oh i love a bit of true crime yeah. um the this is this is a bit of a cop out because I know for a fact that next week's episode recommendation is going to be the same, mm. um, but it's the, um, I think it's called Unravel. It's the ABC oh, okay. podcast about true crime. Okay. Um, and the guest that we'll have next week um, talks about um, season four, uh, which is about a fraudster. Um, and that that was a really good uh, so podcast. is it the whole season like one crime? Or yes. Is it, oh, yes. Okay. So they so, so they different. have different seasons, and yeah. then they each season starts sure. on a crime. Sure. Um, that's really good. And the other one, I think that was a one rip podcast as well about another about a serial killer. Mm. Um, so I'm giving you four. Um, I'll link the name of the podcast. Um, uh, because they had like a like a funky name. Oh, and Doctor Death. That's another. I've I just got heaps. And Doctor yeah. Death's another about a guy who. Um, basically was a killer not intentionally but he was just um not capable of being a good doctor yeah. and there's just a story around that and this, the way the system failed to protect people Ugh. um so yeah there's a bunch there for you yeah that's a that's a big spread that's a big spread um what software can't you live without uh oh gmail yeah. um and google calendar are really big for me gmail for emails or we use g suite which is powered by gmail and google um uh, Google Calendar, just because it keeps track of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I mean, Google Chrome, again, I feel like this is all about Google and Google mm-hmm. Drive. It's mm-hmm. just we use a lot of their services, so um, yep. I couldn't recommend them enough in the way they integrate. Um, Google Drive's fantastic. Um, we've just sort of outgrown Google um, yeah. a little bit. Like, we've gone to a locally... Um, everywhere in the accessible local storage solution. Yeah. Um, but for a long time, I just used Google Drive. Um, and the beauty with Google Drive is that it just synchronizes um, to the yeah. cloud and you just can't lose any files, yeah. which is always handy. Yeah. Um, three mantras you live by. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, these are more like phrases, but, you know, no matter what you do, just make sure and, and work hard to be the best at it. Yeah. Um, this is something that I got a long time back, you know, whether, you, whether you're a janitor, just work hard. Be, once you get good enough, you can own a cleaning business and, you know, there, it, there's there's nothing stopping you from um, finding success and creating success. Yeah. Um, that's one. Um, second one I would say is, um, again, it's, it's a mantra on my end is, I try and approach people and talk to people from a point of view that they they always start from a point of good yeah. and goodness. Yeah. Um, and that if they if they end up being angry or mean or rude, um, that is not. Uh, it's more of a reaction to something that's happening around them. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's not a reflection of you. And yeah. it's, it's not personal. Yeah. Um, and just look at it that way. Yeah. Makes things much easier because you sort of don't end up sort of going, you know, oh, why didn't blah 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 like respond me. to my text yeah, or like yeah, yeah. me or think I was rude or respond to my email. I yeah. think it, you, because those sorts of things, especially when, if you're a caring person, you get sort of, you know, oh, what did I say? Why, why aren't they responding yeah, to my Yeah, yeah, it weighs on your mind. And I mean, and even if you have, you know, a business where you're talking to a lot of clients, I'm assuming it would be the same way. Same where, thing. Yeah. You even know, staff, same yeah, thing. Like, yeah. you know, what, why, why aren't I hearing back from them? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, um, just, just, yeah, take, take that sort of approach that everyone starts from that point of goodness and wanting to help. Yeah. Um, and that just the world and life just might sort of skew that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, people are very, like, you know, self-focused. So if they're, you know, going through some stuff, it, yeah. it, it'll affect them, you know. Yeah. And it's very rarely that, you know, you're thinking about someone else, you know, oh, you know, Jermaine, he made me stay an extra hour after work. <laughs> I hate this guy so much. It's like, nah, you forget about it as soon as you hop in the car. Yeah. So it's like, Is that are you speaking from experience? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> um, what's the third one? Um, I think the third and, and biggest one for me is, and it, this is a bit of a cliche as well, is that um, there's no mistakes 
Um, mm. I, I look back at life and, you know, people say, oh, what's like one big mistake? It's not a, it's not a mistake because it's a learning opportunity, whether it's, you know, a friend that you really shouldn't have made because yeah. they, you know, steered you in the wrong way or whatever it is. Ultimately, you're here today because of what you've sort of gone through in the past. And um, that's, that's something that I, it helps you sort of not dwell on things. Yeah, I, I feel like I've had it described to me in a way, you know, mistakes are often, you know, expensive ways to learn lessons, you know, like whether you lend some money to a person and you never get it back or like, you know, as you said before, you know, you do work for people and they don't pay you back. It's like you can either look at it as this person stole money for you from you or it's an expensive lesson in Man, I've got to vet my clients a bit, yeah, <laughs> a bit, a bit better, better so they don't steal it from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or work on your systems and processes so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, three people you admire. Ooh, um, Bill Gates. Yeah. Um, I think the reason I admire Bill Gates is pretty, pretty. And, and for this response, I'm going to just stick to sort of public figures. I think it's very easy for me to just turn around and say, my mom, my um, dad, yeah. my mom. <laughs> yeah, 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 very yeah, easy, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like look at what they sacrifice and so on and so forth. And, but it's a bit of a cop out because, you know, they're not, they, they, they don't provide, they can't provide value to you in the same way that, because, you know, their, their life isn't sort of captured in the same way that. Yeah. And um, it's like a given. It's like, if your parents aren't going above and beyond for you, like. <laughs> yeah. I feel sorry for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, honestly. It's just something that you, it's, it is, a, it is a, a fairly sort of given yeah. thing. And there are bad um, parents out there, don't get me wrong, but. Yeah. yeah. Um, but going back to Bill Gates, um, just, just that, the mentality around using business to, um, make money and then using those profits to make an impact on the world. I think mm. there's a lot to be, be learned there. Mm. Um, and just, just sort of, yeah, everything that has happened since, um, ooh, two other people. Um, this is going to be a bit funny, but I, I, I respect the Kardashians, um, yeah. just because they're just strong business operators. It yeah. doesn't matter. You know, people say, oh, you know, one video and you, the whole family is sort of, um, famous. Which is not true, by the way. It's just such a, such a gross understatement of the level of work that you had to put into it. Yeah. Um, and I just, it, I think it's very interesting. Again, is, is an example of whatever you do and, and, you know, take seizing opportunities and, yeah. and using those opportunities to then further, um, a, a, a goal of yours. Yeah. Um, just fantastic and how they've all diversified into, um, music and cosmetics and fashion and, and just, yeah. just the works. Yeah. Um, of course. Is, is really interesting. So that's not one person. That's sort of a, a whole, um, family. Um, and a third person. Ooh. Oh man. There, there's just so many. I mean, a lot of, a lot of business founders are just, really interesting and awesome to follow mm. um actually you know what let's say kevin o'leary um i don't know if you've heard of him from shark tank no, um he's again a very very smart and well-off um sort of man who i think has just i just it, admire how he looks at business um how he looks at just just things like business as a as just what it is it's not nothing personal it's just you know uh a service that you're providing and he's going to you have what he thinks about it yeah even if he doesn't think that it's that great yeah um and that sort of candid um approach to it um is just it's really nice in a world where there's a lot of yes men i mean and just sugarcoating right yeah yeah sort of like softening like you know yeah that was really nice hayden i just won't use that design yeah or more of how about you change this like or you know as he likes to put it your business is bad and it deserves to be, you know, taken around the back and then shot dead and just start on something. New. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of maybe you should like take it to that extent, especially <laughs> if like your little brother's like coming to you and you're like, Oh, I want to start <laughs> this, this lemonade stand. And you're yeah. like, you <laughs> but yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I think, uh, if you want to like, you know, work <laughs> in any industry, you need to actually take on constructive criticism and realize that, like in life, like the L's you take are actually when you learn the most. So, yeah, because if stuff is just like going well for you and you got no adversity, you're never going to get better. At no, then, then there's no reason to then be pushed. And yeah, push yourself. So, yeah. Um, well, that about about, that about wraps it up. Um, it's been a pretty meaty episode. I'm glad we've done this because we were supposed to do this, I think, you know, a long time. And I've been pushing to interview Jermaine. 
for a very long time. Hey stranger, thanks for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit subscribe and the notification bell. It really helps us with the YouTube algorithm. Also, don't be a stranger. Please leave a comment, let us know what you think, hit the like button. All my socials are down there as well. So if you wanna reach out to me, say hello, uh, have a conversation, I'd love that.